So let's hit the relapse refractory population. So let's talk about mechanisms of resistance with a root nib. Who wants this job? Who wants the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> of course. I was about to say, you know. Sure. <laughs> uh, so yeah, resistance to BTK inhibitors is, uh, is a topic, uh, but we should first say it's not a very common clinical problem. It is a problem that we encounter in high-risk patients, oftentimes patients who have uh, either 17p deletion or maybe who have 17p deletion and prior exposure to uh, chemoimmunotherapy or complex karyotype. Those patients uh, have uh, remission duration on BTK inhibitors that are maybe approximately three years or so, so there's a sizable number in, in this high-risk population uh, who eventually progress. They respond well, but then progress. And in those patients, uh, oftentimes what's seen are BTK point mutations or PLC gamma 2 mutations, which are uh, related to a kinase uh, that's in the BC receptor signaling pathway and which turns on the pathway independent of BTK. Those can be found, interestingly, they are not oftentimes not found in the majority, but oftentimes in a small pop subpopulation of uh, CLL cells. And whether or not they are driving the, the resistance, uh, that's not entirely clear. Uh, but uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, it is good to uh, identify high-risk patients in the relapse setting and to be aware that patients, if they respond to BTK inhibitors, uh, if that's used, um, to identify those uh, that uh, relapse. And then what is the salvage strategy right now? Uh, if a clinical trial is not available, then there's good data with the BCL2 antagonist with the venetoclax to be used in that situation. Now, we saw lots of data um, about some of the new non-covalent BTK inhibitors at this meeting. So you want to comment a little bit briefly before we go more into the relapse? So I think, um, I think it's quite interesting uh, data. I think uh, today uh, the LOXO data was presented uh, for the first time as far as I know. And uh, it, it quite exciting to really understand that I fully agree that, uh, thanks God, the, the onset of these resistant mutations are not as common, at least really limited to this high-risk population. And definitely, we're going to have another alternative besides the classical BCL2 inhibitor in the future, really with, with agents that seems that even uh, they are not really, they are reversible, this, uh, contrary to the irreversible action of the ones that we are available, they may really have a role on, the, on those patients who, once again, they, they really may benefit of these long-term therapies and, and we will be able, at least it's been shown, that um, all those patients with, with specific mutation, with 481, they can be, can be salvaged and obviously very, very short follow-up, very early data is still, you know, need to be expanded. The same thing, um, we are waiting to see the data with the VECA to more, more to, to mature as well the, the ARC-51. So I think it's, it's quite exciting time because we're really bringing more, more drugs to, to, the, to the treatment of patients who may not really go well at some point with the standard BTK, BTK therapies. You know, I think it's very important whenever you're discussing, you know, the cysteine 41 serine mutation that we, we actually talk about Dr. Berger's data with regard to sort of the, the appearance of that mutation or that mutation probably pre-existing the initiation of therapy and explaining how that really might um, impact upon future therapeutic options. And I think that's something that when we talk about, you know, these novel reversible inhibitors sort of preventing those clones from growing out because they're already there. And so that would be sort of how we would most immediately see that result in a, a different outcome. I think another point, if I may add to that, uh, these are again extremely important uh, research questions. Yeah. Uh, again, that assay is not widely available outside of a few academic centers. Uh, we still don't know what level of mutational burden correlates with progressive disease. Uh, patients with the low burden of mutations can still have progressive disease and patients with a high burden may not have progressive disease clinically. And the other question is, not everyone has the mutation who progresses. So I think it, it still um, is, an, is an excellent tool uh, to identify those patients who would be at high risk for progression. But does that really change how we manage our patients, the vast majority of our patients right now? I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, most of our patients would 
progress clinically and then they would be treated with an alternative agent at this point. So I think in that regard, um, having access to that test would be very helpful for these alternative PTK inhibitors. Uh, but I think we also have to caution that when patients do progress on BTK inhibitors, typically we suggest that they don't have a long disease or drug holiday when they transition from one agent to another, because a lot of us have seen patients progress fairly rapidly once you stop the BTK inhibitor if they have documented clinical progression.